I so somehow inherited the, the, the title from, 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 from my colleague Ramin Tinati, um, who was initially um, uh, supposed to give the talk. And, and then it was handed over to me, which is completely fine because uh, that is about something we work together on anyway. And the title was the Web Science Macroscope Mixed Method Approach uh, for Understanding Web Activity. So the first question is, who in the room um, knows the macroscope? Brilliant. <laughs> no one does. That's good. That's good. So, so the talk is organized in a way um, that I would like to confront you with a couple of, of the research, challenge, research challenges we have in, in wh what we call web science. Yeah? So, um, and I go through them um, and show you two flip sides of, the, of a coin. Okay? So, and I do that in a, in, a, in a very, very unreflected way initially, and, and it's deliberate. Okay? So, um, and I come in the end to a point, because the macroscope is something that exists as a prototype at the moment in ECS. You will see that later. But it also, and that is why it's so exciting to give that talk, it, it also has become a project very recently. So there's, a, there's an agenda to evolve this into something that is slightly different from what we see at the moment. Um, there's, a, there's a roadmap for that, and, and part of the talk will be to communicate that roadmap, which is largely methodological, um, a methodological challenge for us, um, which will kick off um, mid of the year and as you just heard, since I'm leaving the university, will then again be taken over by, by Ramin um, uh, himself. And that is why I want to pay credit or give credit to the people that are involved in this, which is Ramin and it's also Kate Lyle from, from, <coughs> socials, uh, from sociology. Bo these two people were heavily involved in the, in the writing of the proposal and they are involved in the story that I'm going to tell you about the microscope. And since no one raised the hand, no one will be surprised by that, um, uh, uh, that agenda that we outlined in the proposal, which has been funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering recently. OK, since I'm a computer scientist, I have to talk about technology. And I have to remind ourselves about that's the World Wide Web. Uh, this is the proposal Tim submitted in 1989, wh where someone wrote on top of it, or his line manager wrote, va vague but interesting. Um, <laughs> and we, we in these days, we know. <laughs> Somehow it was um, interesting. So th that is the system, the information system that, that, uh, that was born out of CERN. Right? So it was born as a proposal to, to, to solve the, the information management problem they had, they had at CERN, where they had um, uh, collaboration between physicists to organize yeah, around the topics they re researched there. And um, at that time, computers were very, very costly. Um, and every computer was so costly and so interoperable that the, the exchange of, of information across offices was really a challenge. Yeah? So um, that was the idea that then grew out into that socio-technical system that we know today, and which, which brings out a lot of that social media content. Yeah? Even though we have see technically a slight transition from the original principles of the web, and these are the ones I would like to highlight here again. Yeah, it's, it's, it's unique addressing, globally unique addressing is the key, the key feature of the World Wide Web as Tim, as Tim uh, thought about it, right? The rest is hypertext, so linking from one state to the other and stuff like that. But addressing and decentralization are really the core principles within the World Wide Web. Okay, so everyone can share information, hand out the address to someone else, the other one can retrieve it, and it's independent of the machine. Okay, so that, that, that evolved uh, into, into the system we have today with all those web applications that run there like Twitter, social media platforms that, that break with those principles because you can't send a link to someone, you have to send a proprietary reference and share and do things like that. An essential part of this of the, the World Wide Web story within um, Southampton and increasingly across the boundaries is our what, what they people call web observatories. Okay? The, and they take up the principles of decentralization and attach it to the problem of sharing that data that, that Carl was just talking about, that social media data not everyone has <laughs> access to in an equal fashion, right? Some <coughs> people have access, and we heard that uh, from the audience, to 20% of the Twitter feed. There is, there is, an, there, there is a, a group in, within MIT that is directly funded by Twitter and has access to 100%, and it's, it might still not be representative, okay? So, and then there's, there's the, the, the long tail that has access to 1% or can, can sort of um, engineer nice search queries to get access to more, to more content from Twitter. And web observatories um, are, uh, are build an infrastructure where these data sources like Twitter, Facebook, and other data sources that are from and about the web are gathered. And they are gathered not in one place, they are gathered in research um, data repositories across the world, and then they attach a metadata schema to describe the resources in your, in your, um, in your research reposito data repository, and then you can build decentralized cataloging on top of that. And, and the entire story is also about 
also to refer to the studies that were done the, to that data, to refer to the methods applied to manipulate that data, to imper interpret it, and so on and so forth, so that you end up with an interlinked network of research data, methods applied, studies conducted, papers published. Okay, so that's, the, that's what a, a web observatory is, and it goes from th through the pipeline from data sources, data collection, data storage, then data analysis and modeling, and we heard a bit of about that. If you do that in a generic fashion, you can end up with a, with a mess. Yeah? Um, data visualization, data interpretation, and there's obviously, there, there are there are feedback loops to inform the building of those pipelines. What to observe, and that is a quick word about the Social Machines project. Um, when Tim Berners-Lee reflected upon the invention of the World Wide Web, and that is uh, a document in a book called Weaving the Web, he, he described that transition from the, the web of hypertext, web of document, as you can say, through a web of data, semantic web, uh, to, and that's largely, I always divide it into the three part, last part, which is the web that enables the construction of social machines which he abstractly defined as some form of no new social processes that emerge uh, enabled uh, due to that technology. The Social Machine Project um, is funded to underpin this um, with theory and practice. So with, a, with something that unpacks <coughs> that fr abstract <coughs> phrase and says, well, this is actually what social machines are, what differentiates social machines from human computation, social computing, Computer support, supported collaborative work, um, and there is there are more phrases for socio-technical systems where people, human collectives, solve problems. And we obse observe them, uh, obse observe social machines, which are systems like Twitter, systems like Wikipedia, and do studies. And this is the uncritical part now, okay? And that's deliberate. So, for example, we can measure topics out, topic outbreaks across systems. Yeah? So we can monitor um, uh, viewing logs from, from Wikipedia, which are openly available. Um, so you can, you can trace when do p people access which page in Wikipedia. And you can compare this in a way which is very similar to what we've seen before to, um, to, to topics that occur on Twitter. Yeah? The topics are, in the ca in case of Twitter, defined as some probabilistic model applied to 140 characters in, at scale. Okay, at the scale of loads of messages of that size. So that could be one of the, uh, it was one of those studies we conducted where, where you then can see a shift when something trends, okay? And that, that can tell you um, more about uh, the relevance of the system. You can also see topic outbreaks across system, uh, about, about across cultures, where, where topics of particular kinds show the same patterns across cultures, for example, <coughs> as in the, in the Anglo-American uh, um, space where this, uh, the Asian space, okay? So um, a very, very similar study, again, looking at Wikipedia uh, um, ac uh, activity logs uh, where pe how people looked at pages and um, just looking at bursts of activity, comparing them across different language versions of Wikipedia. There's more. There are also partici uh, participation patterns in citizen science projects. Citizen science is... Um, employing or exploiting u um, human users for crowdsourcing scientific tasks the computer is currently bad at. For example, image recognition. Yeah, we have machine learning, but to do effective machine learning, you, you what you need is training data, which is um, hand-labeled data where the human user told the machine that a particular feature that we're looking for is in some place. Yeah, and we need a certain amount of that labeled training data, which is pre filtered by human users to, to have an effective machine that then is applied to, to data where we don't have the labels and then uh, learns them themselves. That has been done uh, uh, to, to conduct particular tasks in science. Um, and, and that's what we then call citizen science, where the human users uh, on the web are invited to contribute through crowdsourcing to, to those to label data. One project is iWire, which is a, a game where you can slice through 3D images of the frontal cortex of the brain. And I'm not the expert, but it has something to do with our vision. And the plan is to, to get a 3D atlas of, um, of, the, of the connection of, of neural uh, structures in that part. The computer has pre-filtered those images and to certain accuracy fulfilled tho those puzzles and you help to complete and that is then training data to make the, the machine smarter. And we did studies where we, could, uh, uh, um, where we analyzed the chat function that they uh, uh, provide because they understand themselves as a, as a game to map the brain. So you can chat with peers, you get scores for how well you did and then you get ranked. And we, we looked at participation <coughs> and communication patterns. So for what, what, when are people actually speaking? Do they speak before they start solving the puzzle? What do they say while they are solving the puzzle? What do they say in the end? 
Okay, so we analyze those participation patterns and f find things about, uh, about team building strategies and, and communication strategies. We did something very similar to the world's largest citizen science project, which is not a game, that's the Zooniverse. Once started as a project to classify this spiral spin of galaxies and now emer or, or evolved towards a platform that houses around about 40 projects at a time. Um, from astrophysics, so the original galaxy spin, color, light emission, for example, or the, or the, the, the frequency of pulsars sending, sending um, signals to um, animals <coughs> in, in the Serengeti that need to be counted and classified and other, and other things. And we analyzed um, chat activity there and applied very, very typical um, uh, uh, analysis for, for to measure community stability based on what people say. So you, ca the, you can measure the linguistic change of a person to position the lifetime of that person within the overall community. So is he in his, in his early days in the community? Is he an established member or is he about to leave? That has been done on other systems before and we applied it to, to this system, found particular patterns there. You can also do map that, put that on a map and say, well, here are the users coming from. Yeah? So this is the location of the users <coughs> in that space. And finally, we also do um, a method that is concerned with, it, um, with temporal patterns of information co-occurrence, which is a particular way of tracing cascades of information independent from the social network. So this is stuff we apply to the data that sits in a or the web observatories uh, of the world that we can um, access through a dedicated infrastructure, but you will ask yourself, uh, where's the macroscope? Yeah? So the macroscope is here. The macroscope is in data analysis and modeling, in visualization and in data interpretation. So we are, we are going to approach that now. So there's the macroscope and currently the macroscope is, is there. So the macroscope currently is data visualization brought out in six large screens um, or 12 large screens or only two, whatever you want, configurable. But at, in ECS we are currently have um, six of those screens positioned that bring visualizations as you have just seen from the analysis that we did to the to the surface to show them to the user. There are other those capabilities or capacities. Um, one is the KPMG um, data observatory um, that pe many people might know from the Data Science Institute in London. Uh, there is one from from Rensselaer called Campfire, where people sit around a circled visualization display and can can sort of interact with that. Yeah. And these have nice interfaces, very, very nicely shaped to, to, put, to bring, in the end, arbitrary visualizations to, this, to these surfaces that they provide. But still, what is the macroscope? Because it's more than six screens showing the, you those visualizations. And now I'm flipping the coin. And I will do so by quoting someone who recently stood in front of those six screens. And we were looking at a visualization of um, Twitter activity in Southampton. And the statement was literally, wow, they don't even know that this is happening. And I ask, what, what, do you, what do you mean by that? And they say, well, they don't even know that we are looking at them. As if we were looking in the bathroom of the people. And that, actually, that is, that is the microscope. And now, in the second part of the talk, I'm going to try to convince you that this is the case. Because do we really think that this is an, uh, a, an event to be addressed in a, in a uh, quantitative way? Yeah? That is um, Haiti in the aftermath of, of the earthquake, for example. And we said no. And, and a lot of web science research that we do is preceded what you have just seen in the last 10 minutes yeah, by, by, by those quantitative analysis, exploratory data analysis to map out the space we are navigating in, in the digital, and the, then doing things like this. So this is a project that I did together with Silke Road that was funded by ESRC and DFID, where we were looking at the messages um, around uh, disastrous events sent out via Ushahidi platforms. Ushahidi is a system that allows you to send SMS um, or messages through a web portal to help complete the map of, a, of an affected uh, region. And that was uh, a successfully bootstrapped in the Haiti example and now evolved towards a fully fledged tool suit that provides four or five different services um, to respond digitally to a, to a disastrous event. What we did is we went there and we looked at the messages because the question is how inclusive is this digital disaster response really? And inclusiveness understood as are the solutions built for the people, with the people in the affected region, just about the people and stuff like that. So it's, it's really stepping away from, from the raw linguistics of messages and we did a mixed methods approach here where we said okay we just apply sentiment analysis yeah by back of words and probabilities um, and we do in parallel to that coding of those messages and then classifying 
are these disasters different from each other? And, and we found differences that, that here in the Haiti example, we find um, requests for help from identified local sources versus Congo, a political crisis um, uh, with massive violence against women, um, where there's information about the situation, but not who's responsible and more non-local sources. So it's outsiders talking about something. It's not the people themselves. And then we went um, to do the Ebola uh, event on Twitter as, as well, um, just to blend that with a pure social media approach. Um, and that one was flooded with tasteless jokes, racist comments, and concerns that the crisis could spread and call the governments to close the borders, which is, and, and that is the real call for the mixed methods here. Yeah? That is the emphasis why, why, that, why that doesn't work in a purely quantitative way. So, and, and the results of the, of the purely quantitative approach actually tell you that, oh, that's all positive. Yeah? If you just classify the polarity of the sentiment in tweets, you end up with, s with, with one of those graphs, which doesn't tell you anything if you, did the if you looked at the qualitative thing before, plus this is the thing that went viral. Yeah? So we, see we read increasing, um, increasingly popular reports in the New York Times about something went viral on social media. And in the end, it's all A, affected by the social network that I assume, because this uh, virality of information is based on the, on the, on the model of information diffusion, yeah, which always assumes a, a network through which something diffuses. Yeah, so the, the, the assessment or the generation of that social network might already be biased because it's based on following, friendship on Facebook and whatever. And then the, the sort of the tracing of the diffusion event through that network is another qu uh, qu uh, quantitative method um, applied to, to that data so might inject further biases. In citizen science we had something very similar because our study of the linguistics showed well that doesn't work at all what we wanted to do here. In the Zooniverse this the uh, notion of linguistic stability as a measure of um, the position of a co uh, member in the community didn't work at all. Now it didn't work because people employ linguistics of completely different rules here. And interestingly, it were these rules that, that led to several serendipitous discoveries in citizen science. So people went to the platform, started to crowdsource, and then stopped at an outlier because there was a blue cloud in front of something saying, what is that blue thing? Yeah? And then they started to discuss this, and then they created particular patterns of communication so that in the end, and that was the very first um, um, uh, discovery, that this is a teacher from, from the Netherlands. She participated in, in Galaxy Zoo, and she made the discovery of that blue thing, I think. She, th she said, what's the blue thing there? And it's the, the, the discovery is now called Hanny's Warweep, and Warweep or Warverb is the Dutch word for thingy, because that is what she said. And that's officially called like that now, because the scientists took that discussion investigated further and, and said, well, that's, that is obviously a, a, an, an unknown uh, energy emission from the stars. That happened on the Zooniverse quite a few times now, um, including that um, new trends or new um, geographic patterns of the Spanish flu were detected because people were digitizing handwritten notes from the First World, uh, World War Western Front, um, where particular deaths weren't re related to any, any fight. They were related to the flu that uh, had sort of affected that area as well. Okay, and the same here with, with this uh, method of information co-occurrence. Um, we can map information in three-dimensional space and we can, we can do a lot of quantitative stuff there, but we used it basically just for temporal sampling, sampled out messages, applied that to the Wikipedia edit history and were able to unmask uh, events that have further qualitative implications. So we were able to detect the, uh, um, a, a burst in the edit activity around a, p a, p a particular set of sites when Edward Snowden gave a, gave a speech at the SXSW conference. And another, s another event was related to, the, to a US, US Supreme Court case on same-sex marriage. And both cases now immediately ask for further research um, into whether there's some form of political bias injected into Wikipedia. Yeah? So. That was the second side uh, that f should further push us towards understanding what is the macroscope. So the macroscope is technology, yeah? So the macroscope is our quantitative methods piped through a standard pipeline that comes from web observatory um, to some visual display. We also say, and th that is something I said before in, in a talk, is there is more than one macroscope because that just was the macroscope. Because I showed you data visualizations which is exactly what this thing does at the moment. Okay, so the, the, the macroscope is the six, <coughs> six screens over there. <coughs> then 
whenever we give talks, we sort of shape one instance of the macroscope that is tailored to the talk, which might be that part of the presentation here. You can also put it as a mobile exhibit somewhere and just put two screens up, refer to our infrastructure, and there it is. And it is also a sta can also be a standalone web application. So what is it really is, and what is it what we want it to be, is it a facility for cross-disciplinary research? So the wow, they don't even know that this is happening, was for me the sort of the, the light bulb moment where I said, well, actually, he, he, we are just two people with a completely different framework, methodological framework to look at that stuff. Yeah? Because obviously, the, the other person came from sociology and had obviously com that was very, a very, very important question that we are just surveying people sending tweets in Southampton <coughs> as if we were looking into the bathroom, even though we weren't. So, the, so th that is um, one line of work that is going to happen within that, that um, funded period for the macroscope now is that how can we turn this to respond to the people using the macroscope? The second is that this is all, and this is what, what the presentation is all about, engaging with the general public. So my data, the results from our studies, just enga engages with, with everyone in the audience. And it is definitely demonstrating the power and the danger of, of individuals sharing o information online, as we have seen. I think there are so, uh, significant uh, examples in there. And it can be a means to develop a situational ethics of data. And I refer that to Susan Herford, um, um, but she doesn't want to be um, quoted. She said it's, it's she, she can't claim authorship for this, but she was the one mentioning that in one of our discussions that the microscope really is a facility where you come and you can develop a situational ethics of data together with the people engaging with it, which are diverse audiences, scholars and people from the general public. So the, the microscope might stand between scholars and the public to communicate research from the scholars to the public. It can be only the public interacting with the, the macroscope as a form of an exhibit somewhere, or just the scholars with, uh, with, the, with the macroscopes or with these visualizations um, as within ways, for example. And then in the end, this should be studied. Yeah? And this is the key, the key message, what, what the macroscope is, and what makes the macroscope more than the visual interface it, uh, the, so the outline for the project evolves it into also the, the accompanying um, um, methods to study what people do that engage and interact with the microscope. And now, since I'm 47 seconds over, it's just one, one and a half slides, and, I, I, and I, um, I, I decided to be cheeky in the end, and I don't get away uh, doing a talk about basically visual analytics with, without um, quoting Schneiderman, yeah? So uh, everyone will know the mantra for, for visual analytics from Schneiderman, overview first, zoom and filter, then details on demand, and I would expand that one and capture the engagement. And that is literally what the microscope is about. Thank you very much.